What is up? I am Evan Lovett, and welcome to my new podcast, In a Minute with Evan Lovett. This is an Odyssey original brought to you by my company, In a Minute Media, coming to you live from my studio in the heart of my favorite city in the world, Los Angeles, California. Let's get into it. Woo! What is up? This is Evan Lovett. Welcome to episode one of my new podcast, In a Minute with Evan Lovett. I am excited to be here. I am glad that you are here. This is new ground for me. There's going to be hiccups, so bear with me and learn with me. Um, I try to be informative. I try to be entertaining, but either way, I'm going to talk about some fun stuff coming to you from the heart of Los Angeles. Not necessarily all about Los Angeles, but look, the truth is my perspective is LA and we're going to go on this journey together. And I know there are people from everywhere, from New York, London, Australia, Singapore, Mexico, you name it. But look, Los Angeles is a beacon and it's a place that people love or they hate. It's a lightning rod, but they know LA and most importantly for me, my heart is here in Los Angeles. So that's always where I'm coming from. It's not always about Los Angeles, but it is. All right. Current events, facts, information, tidbits, trivia. I'm excited to share it with you. I'm excited to be here. This is going to be a ton of fun. So I really do want to get into it. But look, first we have some housekeeping to take care of. If I had to put a rating on my podcast, it'll probably skew PG-13 from time to time, especially when I get into some of the intimate and personal details of my life. So to the parents out there, some guidance will be suggested. So first of all, who am I and why am I here? Well, the reason I'm here is because of LA in a Minute. LA in a Minute is a social media mainstay, if I do say so myself. Um, I started in January of last year, so we're going on about 13 months, have amassed 250,000 followers in about a year, which is pretty good. But here's the truth. I never set out to do that. I'm not an influencer. I'm not a quote unquote creator, even though maybe I am, but that's not my intention. I'm just this relentlessly curious guy with a genuine, genuine, <laughs> genuine, with a genuine passion and I'm excited to share all that. I mean, look, short form learning uh, has been one description of what I do. But the thing is, I think all of us just want to know about the world around us, things around us, people around us, and just be more enlightened, more aware. And it's cool when you're driving down the street, which we do in Los Angeles all the time. You know the old trope, nobody walks in Los Angeles. But no, when you're driving in Los Angeles, what is that building? I've heard of this neighborhood, Boyle Heights. What is it all about? Wait, look at those palm trees. What? Palm trees aren't from Los Angeles? Yes, all that's fun. So, I mean, that's LA in a minute, and that's where I come from. And the thing is, okay, LA in a minute started. It started because of my son. Now, my son is my inspiration. My son is my guiding light. He's nine years old. He's a, <laughs> look, those of you that have kids know what I'm talking about. I always say like this, um, kids are amazing. They are. You look at them, you smile. I look at my son the way that I don't look at anybody. Else. I feel it as I'm looking. I'm like, damn, like you're my son. Like that, like that love. I, I, my dad used to always tell me the same thing. He used to actually say it about grandkids that you never love somebody the way you love your grandkid. But even with my son, it's like that, right? So I look at him and I see that. So my point is, here's why LA in a minute started was, was because of him. Last year, he was eight years old. It's the holiday season. We're at my, uh, my wife's house, right? My wife's Mexican, ton of cousins, ton of relatives, everybody running around. And I'm always this guy. Look, I'm an older dude, if you will, right? But I, I like to know what's up. I do. So I'd always ask her cousins, um, you know, what are the kids into these days? She, she has cousins every age, but like there, there are these few cousins, 16 year old, 21 year old, 30 year old. What are you guys into? Right. Whether it was TikTok at the beginning or whatever the case was. So this was last year and they tell me, you know, TikTok is where we get our news. And I thought that was a terrible idea. I, I, I was like, listen, Facebook quote unquote news almost undermined the entirety of society 
what I knew about TikTok at the time was that it was dances and I don't know, eight second little bits, videos of people. How, how can you get your news via TikTok, right? But it resonated because here's the deal. My son had just gotten into TikTok and I'd see him on screens all the time. And he's on TikTok. He's on YouTube. He's watching this terrible content. Sometimes it was unboxing. Sometimes it was people playing video games, which by the way, I used to do. I used to watch my roommates play video games in college, so I can't talk shit that much. But when I see my son doing it, I'm like, no, you got to be better than that. You got to learn something. And there was always a battle like, yo, you can't have this much screen time. Yeah, in five more minutes. Oh, come on, more screen time. Dude, we'd always have that argument. And finally, I just came up with this thing where I'm like, listen, you can watch the screen tomorrow if you learn something today. I don't care what it is. Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth. Uh, there are eight play planets. There, there used to be nine when I was a kid, but apparently there are eight now. But either way, you learn something, you can watch the screen tomorrow. So flashback to my wife's cousins. We're out there. <laughs> And they're telling me we get our news there. And I'm like, oh, no, this is this is really the end of the world. Um, but they're showing me feeds. New York Times, uh, CNN, Fox News, everybody. And, and it's news. Look, look, I'm from the perspective of I'd rather have you have people in general be informed, get information, get news than the alternative, which is nothing. Go through life ignorance. I'm like, you know what? If these younger kids are telling me that that's where they get their news, then awesome. All right. This is cool. You know, I approve, even though it's not my place to approve. You know, I'm, I'm nothing. I'm some, I'm some schmuck at the time. So I get this idea, right? I tell my son, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, let's read the newspaper together. Yes, I still subscribe to the newspaper. I told you, I told you I'm an older dude, but I do. I subscribe to the physical newspaper. I love it. I love the tactical feel. I love the information. Every morning I wake up, it's like my daily uh, routine. I love it. Well, you can guess what an eight-year-old at the time kind of thought about that, right? He wasn't super excited on the, on the idea of reading the newspaper. But that TikTok plus that newspaper gave me an idea. I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'll download this TikTok app. In fact, I'm going to start a TikTok account. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the news, not, not verbatim, not like read the articles from the newspaper. Right. But I'll synopsize stuff. I used to be a journalist, so I kind of get it more on that later, by the way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some important and interesting stories. And it doesn't necessarily mean the front page stuff, Biden this or formerly Trump that whatever. No, it doesn't. That's not what I mean. I'd find something interesting. I, I, I like to, I'm a curious guy. So I always seem to find something interesting. So I get a couple stories first few days and I called it LA in a minute. I was going to do one minute pieces somewhere along the line. I learned that on social media, don't go longer than a minute. Right. It, it, it was just arbitrary. Um, and the story of a minute is actually a good one too, but hold, I'll give you more on that. But so I was going to do a couple news stories, uh, a synopsis thereof in one minute. Right. So I do my first couple pieces and look, TikTok's algorithm is awesome. Lo and behold, what I end up with is a thousand followers in like two weeks. And for me, somebody who's been on Twitter, I'm like a Twitter nerd. Cause again, Twitter's information, it's news. I had a thousand followers on Twitter in like 14 years. I had a thousand in two weeks on TikTok. I was like, this is great. This is awesome. But the truth is this, the news isn't always fun. It's not even always interesting. Some days go by and there's no stories that are worth telling. No stories that are worth listening to as far as my son's perspective. And he's right. So I'm always reading at the time I was reading this book called made in California by George Geary. Great guy ended up meeting him through Ellie in a minute. But again, that down the road, we'll discuss that. Hopefully we have him as a guest on the podcast in the future, but I'm reading this book made in California. It's about all the restaurant chains that came from California. And now let me tell you, for those of you that don't know, California is like, the bastion it's it's the uh petri dish of food of restaurants especially fast food chains because car culture came from los angeles the first freeways in the united states were in los angeles okay and when you think about it fast food and freeways are inextricable i mean the people want to drive you want to explore you want to keep going 
and you need food. Food is fuel. So you have food in your car. But I'm reading this book and I'm like, whoa, all these fast food places come from LA. So I put together an episode, the 10 oldest fast food chains that come from Los Angeles. Lo and behold, the thing goes, as the kids say, viral, right? Wake up the next morning, 100,000 views on this, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 followers. And I'm like, wait, we have something here. There's history to be told. There's stories to be told that aren't necessarily from the news. They're of Los Angeles. And guess what? My son loved it. He couldn't wait for the next episodes. He was like, let's do more. What are you doing next? What are you going to talk about next? So sometimes it was about the news. Sometimes it was about current events uh, in Los Angeles, the, the, the land of earthquakes, if you will. I remember it was January 17th, the date I'll never forget, the Northridge earthquake. I just did my feelings uh, from the earthquake, the most terrified I'd ever been. I pulled a news report from that day, pulled a broadcast from that day. Again, that episode was big. Coachella, Los Angeles area, talked about Coachella. Just stuff that would happen in Los Angeles. Sometimes it'd be news, sometimes it'd be history. Long story short, in this city where we live, Los Angeles, and you probably heard it wherever on this planet you are, Los Angeles has no history. Los Angeles has no culture. <laughs> well, guess what? That couldn't be further from the truth. Now, Los Angeles is a young city. Los Angeles was founded in 1781, but it didn't really develop until the say, let's say the 1870s, 1880s. Some great reasons, great origin story, movies, oil, water, all these kinds of things. But Los Angeles is a young city, okay? It's not like Rome. Man, I went to Rome with my wife. Beautiful place, beautiful history. And you're walking around amongst ruins, which is just insane. And nobody bats an eyelash, thousands of years old. I went to China. You're walking around stuff 5,000 years old. And everybody, it's, it's normal. Let me tell you, in Los Angeles, if something's 50 years old, you're saying, wow, that's ancient. And if something's 100 years old, you almost can't believe it. So I understand that trope about no history, no culture. But here is the thing. This is the key thing that's always intrigued me. Los Angeles has always been the city of the future. Los Angeles has demolished its past, frankly, to provide for the future. And there are pros and cons. Like, look, Los Angeles is a place to escape. I'm reading this book right now called Southern California Country, uh, Los Angeles, an island, or Southern California Country, an island on the land. And it's written in 1946. I wasn't excited about that. I don't want to really read a book from 1946, but every single page I'm dog earing. I'm like, I got to go back to this. I got to do an episode on this because there are so many stories about how LA developed. And there's so many elements of the history that are interesting, that are important, that dictated that future, that city of the future. And this became my mission with LA in a minute was to tell all of these stories. And all of a sudden it became, I don't want to use the word compulsion, but man, I was doing stuff every single day. I was trying to post eight days a week. I was trying to put up an LA in a minute episode about palm trees aren't native to Los Angeles, even though they're a symbol of our city. Squirrels, which are running around on our roofs, stealing our fruit, not native to the city. By the way, they were brought from the middle of the country by Civil War vets to the Veterans Administration hospitals in Los Angeles. But again, that's the kind of stuff you get into with LA in a minute. But the thing is, I was just exploring and learning and hopefully taking people on this journey and yes, it developed a good following. And luckily, the good folks at Odyssey recognized that. I did some work with one of their stations, KNX. We covered the mayoral election in November. Uh, Rick Caruso against the current uh, mayor, the victor, uh, Karen, uh, Karen Bass. And that became this relationship. And I am thankful for them giving me this opportunity. But that's what LA in a Minute was. And it, it can be fun. It can be irreverent. It can be about sports. I posted a piece on Fernando Valenzuela today. He's getting his number retired by the Dodgers. So you have lighthearted stuff. You have the riots coming up, the uprising, the LA uprising 92. All of this stuff made Los Angeles what it is today. And Los Angeles, this amazing city where I come from, which is going to be my perspective. And that was the perspective of LA in a minute where those episodes come. Now, the question I'm always asked, and I get this quite a bit, is... Who is LA in a minute? Can you do an episode on LA in a minute? 
now look, I'm, <laughs> you, you have to be self-centered at least a little bit to put together a social media feed, right? Um, I wouldn't have started LA in a minute if I didn't want to star in LA in a minute. I mean, that's just how it is. But at the same time, I'm oddly shy. I'm oddly introvert. I'm an extroverted introvert. Some of you people know what that means. And some of you feel that. So I know some of that hit you perfectly right now because that's who I'm. Once I'm comfortable, I'll talk forever. But initially, I'm not the type of person that's ever went up to people at parties. I'm never the type of person with like hate on girls. Like, I don't know. I, I mean, it's just, it's weird. So it's kind of this dichotomy. And even though I don't mind talking to the camera and talking about things, talking about myself becomes a little bit different thing. But again, I get that question enough. And it is intriguing. I just want to let you know that background. So who am I? Who is LA in a minute? Well, let's start here. I'm an only child. Okay. Think what you will. Stereotype. Let those tropes sink in. A lot of them are true. Okay. Uh, I am somebody who listens to all criticism. I'm very thin skinned. Um, do I think things are about me? Like, yes, maybe when they're not. I don't feel like I'm selfish. I don't feel like I'm a baby. Uh, my, my wife might, might think otherwise, but I do think regardless that that is a defining aspect of my personality and a driving force in who I am. But more than that, I'm an only child of my parents. Okay. And, and this is important. I think everybody's parents obviously make them, I mean, you know, go back to Freud or whoever, but, but that is really a, a huge determining influence in, in what you become. So my parents, God love my parents. Well, first of all, they both passed away. My dad died in September of 2017. Very quickly. My mom died in 2019. Very slowly. Um, I was born and raised in Sepulveda. It's now known as North Hills, but Sepulveda is a a lifeline in Los Angeles, the longest street in Los Angeles. In fact, 42.8 miles. It goes from, I want to say Mission Hills to uh, El Segundo or Long Beach. It's, it's the longest street in LA, which in itself is kind of cool. But it's now named North Hills. Um, but my parents, man, I got to tell you, some people had terrible upbringings. I know that I'm extremely fortunate. My parents love the shit out of me. Like, frankly, that's that's what it was. My mom Every single day, I'm proud of you. Hey, mom, I tied my shoes. Oh, I'm so proud of you, baby bird. Yes, she called me baby bird, okay? Sometimes BB for short, but usually baby bird. And my dad, he was this huge dude, right? 6'5", 230, stern, could get mean with anybody. He was a forming, former boxing manager, okay? Um, but with me, he was nothing but supportive and loving and... Uh, when he passed away in 2017, it was a shock to everybody because I, I did see him going downhill. I mean, here's the truth, okay? My dad, uh, <laughs> my parents were hippies, okay? Uh, my dad burned his draft card. My mom burned her bra. They were as liberal and as hippie as you can get. And I, I grew up that way. Now, now, it's a little bit different nowadays. Now that I'm becoming a homeowner, it's a little bit different, but... Um, my dad was this, was this hippie and he was always open. He was always supportive. Um, but he had that, that sternness to him and he was stoic. Um, but he loved me, coached my baseball teams, but I saw him kind of going downhill towards the end. He, uh, look, he loved weed, loved drugs in his day. He just did. Um, and he had a job. He worked for the state of California. That was, that was a day job, by the way. He was, was moonlighting as a boxing manager, but that was a day job. But he would toy around with stuff. I, I, I've seen him, uh, you know, drunk and wobbling and all this kind of stuff. But towards the end of his life, I know that he got into my mom's meds, right? Like my mom from 2000 on had huge back pains, huge chronic pain problems, and she was prescribed everything from, you know, number one painkillers uh, through Oxycontin. I know fentanyl is the big dog now, but Oxycontin was the one at the time. And she used to have what's called a triple script where you need a, a three times signed prescription to even get the stuff that she was taking. And she took it for pain 
Although, again, being a former hippie, she probably took a little too much sometimes. But my dad would even sometimes take her meds, right? And so I, I'd go over there sometimes. They'd both be catatonic. And it was like these parents that had such great energy and showed me Los Angeles and loved Los Angeles. Like, it was weird seeing them like that, right? And I'm not, look, I'm not a stranger. I partied. I had fun. I had a great time growing up. I went to UCLA again. <laughs> Look, LA nerd, I wanted to stay local. I only applied to three schools, UCLA, USC, and Berkeley. And I only applied to Berkeley just to see if I would get in. I didn't, spoiler alert. Um, but I only wanted to go to UCLA or USC either way. But either way, I stayed local. So I was close to my parents and, you know, I saw them good. Towards the end, I saw them bad. But I did not think my dad was going to pass away. And he had a foot surgery. And somehow that foot surgery led to a blood clot, which ended up killing him. And that really was traumatic, to say the least, for my whole family, especially my mom, who was the one who, since about 2000, had been addicted to pain pills, was on medical beds. I mean, the whole deal. And she had to persevere and she had to keep going for the next 18 months, even with COPD and this chronic pain. She had a spinal fusion that didn't take. So she had to get the equipment from the spinal fusion taken out of her back. I mean, she was done for. She was basically anorexic. I mean, she had eating disorders. She had a drug dependency. She had physical malfunctions. I mean, the whole book, and it was tough to see, but the whole time they really did put me first and I'm forever thankful. And you know what? The truth is like my parents instilled this love of Los Angeles in me. Um, and this positive spirit in the world that I utilize to this day, or I try to, you know, everybody has negative days, but they'd take me to Griffith park, Venice beach, Dodger stadium. When my dad was a box manager, his gym was at 108th and Broadway. That's in South Los Angeles. He'd take me down there and we'd cruise and we'd hang out. And we'd, I'd get to see LA. I'm a kid. I don't know the difference. I don't know the difference, but LA is LA. Everything was awesome. We'd go back home. We'd swing through Boyle Heights and go, go to El Tepayac and get a five pound burrito, bring it home for the family and the neighbors. Like it's one thing that they always did was just let me know that Los Angeles is this amazing and unique place. And to use that as the perspective for seeing the world, appreciate everybody as they are appreciate everything my mom was so big on appreciating everything the trees the jac jacaranda trees in los angeles these are beautiful purple trees they bloom for like two weeks a year but those two weeks you could bet my mom was taking me to the spots in los angeles just to see these purple blossoms that bloom all over los angeles and in venice beach my dad you know the, the, you, you've seen the videos you've seen uh, the stuff on youtube but you, the dude on his roller skates playing guitar the naked cowboy all this all this kind of stuff man it was it's los angeles and one thing that i never that they never instilled in me yet they did instill in me without me realizing was how cool los angeles the people of los angeles are now there's this meme I always go back to that, that people from outside Los Angeles sometimes think Los Angeles is just Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, and um, Hollywood. It's not. That, that, that's the, I don't want to say the worst part of Los Angeles, but the cliche part of Los Angeles. But real Los Angeles is San Pedro, Silmar, Commerce, Cerritos, Downey. Um, there's so many communities in Los Angeles and so many different types of people but we have the most seamless diversity in the world. And this is what my parents would, would teach me without teaching me, sending me to public schools in retrospect. I'm like, wait, we got black people, Armenian people, Guatemalan people, uh, Vietnamese people, uh, every type of people you can imagine. And yes, look, is there racism? Of course there is. And in fact, in LA's history, it's an extremely racist city. Just see LAPD. And by the way, on that note, police work hard, I don't want to get into this yet. We will get into this, but I, I have utmost respect for police and I do understand the, the opposite perspective. But the fact is the LAPD was hella racist for a long time and that that needs to be reckoned with. Um, but the, 
but otherwise like the diversity of Los Angeles, the people of the Los Angeles, that's the flavor. That's the culture you drive anywhere in LA. You got a Korean barbecue spot next to a Chinese noodle place next to a taco dude on the street next to a Jewish deli. I mean like this is LA. It's amazing. It's a, it's a great place. And my parents always instilled that in me. And that's basically like who I am and what defined me because I remember growing up, I was just infatuated. If somebody, Val Kilmer went to Chatsworth High, Barack Obama went to Occidental. Um, I was a huge baseball guy. So uh, Giancarlo Stanton went to Sherman Oaks, Notre Dame. I would know every high school, every college of an LA person. And, and just, it sort of stood out for me. So how did that lead into In a Minute with Evan Lovett? What was the progression? How did we get here from all that, right? You know, I went to UCLA, but, but what was I doing? What happened after? Well, UCLA, <laughs> I went there because I wanted to be a baseball player. And in fact, I was an invited walk-on, right? To try out. I try out for the baseball team. And, um, you know, I, I, I make their, their winter fall ball squad, the first, first quarter. And I'm looking around. <laughs> it's guys like Troy Gloss. Uh, Royce and Eric Valent, these two awesome brothers, Jim Parquet, Jim Park, um, eventually Tr Chase Utley. Now, I graduated high school at 16 years old. I was a pretty good baseball player, okay? I could throw mid-80s. For anybody that knows baseball, that sounds fast, but for a right-handed dude that's about six feet tall, that's dime a dozen. But I was 16, so there was potential there. I could have played JC, probably could have played a lower-level D1, but I wanted to go to UCLA, so I took the opportunity to walk on. Well, once I walk in that locker room, <laughs> I knew that this wasn't happening, no matter what kind of evolution I would go through. Um, so I'm at UCLA, want to be a baseball player. And you know the old adage, those that can do, those that can't teach. Well, so I couldn't, and I couldn't teach because I was just a freshman, sophomore in college. But what I did find out about is I could write. So I wrote for the Daily Bruin, which is one of the best college newspapers. And for the Daily Brew, and I started writing sports, worked my way up to be sports editor. Um, and I was like, I want to be a journalist, but I wanted to be a TV journalist. Okay. I, I, back in the day, TV news, TV was where people got their news and TV was where people got their sports. Eventually ESPN, but in my head, I was going to start locally. And lo and behold, got an internship at NBC for Fred Rogan. Those of you from Los Angeles know Fred Rogan. He recently retired. Legend in the sports broadcasting scene. Legend in the broadcasting scene. 40 plus years. Great career, Fred Rogan. But I'm interning for him. And by this point, I'm a senior. <laughs> I'm a senior in college at UCLA. And I have this internship. And what are you supposed to do as an intern? You're supposed to work hard. You're supposed to outwork everybody. You're supposed to stand out. But... I knew in my head, or I thought I knew in my head, that I was just going to kill it on the screen test. What the screen test is, is after your internship, you get to sit in Fred Rogan's chair. You get to read the script like tonight. You know, back then, what was that? Uh, who was in the late night? Oh, fuck. Kobe. Kobe Bryant's dropped 36 points. Lakers beat the Bucks 116. Anyway. So what I would do, would cut highlights. And, um, you know, the other interns, there's four of us. The shift was 7 to 11. They would show up at 6, 6.30, stay till 12, 30, 1 o'clock, put, put VHS tapes. Anybody remember VHS tapes? Put them in alphabetical order, file all this stuff. Me? I'd show up at 7 sharp. I'd leave at 11 sharp. I made no additional effort. And this is during the winter, right? I'm a baseball guy. So the sports we were like covering at the time were basketball and hockey. I like basketball. I even like hockey, but... I wasn't about to put in the extra work because I knew that my screen test would be so awesome that I'd be able to send my tape out to networks and get my, my get my career started as a sports broadcaster. So flash forward to the end of the internship and everybody does their screen test. And I, I go fourth. I go last of the four of us, right? First three dudes go first. I think it was two, two men, one woman. They go, everybody does fine. We're all wearing our suits. We're all like looking all sharp, right? I'm the last one to go. So I'm reading the sports. I'm sitting in Fred Rogan's chair. And all of a sudden, the producer comes in. Evan. And listen, the producer didn't interrupt anybody before me. The producer only. So I was like, oh, this can't be good. He's like, could you please enunciate more? 
So for all of my ego, all of what I thought was my intelligence, I had never heard the word enunciate previously. So I was like, enunciate, what does that mean? And enunciate means to basically pronounce clear, but I didn't know that. So I thought it meant talk louder. So what I ended up doing was reading the rest of the sports report in a loud voice and they cut me off early. They're like, all right, Evan, that's enough. And at that moment, I knew that it wasn't meant to be for me as a broadcaster, at least at that moment in time. And so many lessons came out of that work hard. Even if I thought I would have been the best of all time, just, just work hard and try and, and complete your obligation do what you're supposed to do. But I didn't, but it was a good learning lesson. And guess what? After that went into the private sector, got into PR for a second, got into uh, uh, internet advertising, which ended up being a great career, but I never scratched that itch. I was always just so curious and wanted to learn. And more importantly, I was what they call an information station. I love getting information and then telling it to other people like that's for whatever dopamine or serotonin hits in your brain, that's something that always like excited me. So I just wanted to get info and tell people that you hear a story. Oh my God, I got nowadays, you know, still to the same, I text my buddies like, and I'm sure a lot of you guys do that. That it's fun. It, 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 it hits something for you. So I was an information station, but I never got to scratch that ish and internet advertising, great career, fun, decent money was knock on wood, not affected by, by the first recession recession. I don't know if we're in a recession now, but so far so good. Um, but I get into internet advertising and it was great. And it was fulfilling to an extent because it's, uh, it's uh, professionally successful. But again, it, at the core, I was always self-conscious. I was like, is this really me? Started a blog. You guys remember blogs. I had a sports blog. I had a cooking blog. I was into gardening for a minute. I used to incorporate all that. Started a blog at one point called Off the Freeway, which was a very, very uh, nascent precursor I guess to LA in a minute because we would talk about cool stuff off the freeway. And again, LA car culture, freeway culture, that's what it was all about. So that was with a couple friends did stuff like that. I had a political newsletter, email newsletter, things like that, but it never really came together until that, you know, t last year or two years ago, I guess now 2021 with the cousins where I'm just like, dang, I should talk about LA and, you know, provide and be a facilitator for the information that I collect, you know, broadcast that. And fortunately enough, that turned into something that to this day, you know, I still get recognized. I get recognized last night. I was at Sharky's, which is a dope, like organic Mexican inspired. I don't want to call it Mexican, but burritos, tacos, enchiladas, nachos, things like that, but healthy organic place uh, from LA and you get recognized and it feels great. And people are like, keep going, keep doing what you're doing. We love learning about Los Angeles. We love learning about the world. And that's my thing. We all love learning together. And that's what this podcast is about. That's what in a minute with Evan Lovett is going to be about. Okay. Like there will be stories and hopefully it's going to be entertaining and compelling and you want to listen and you want to share it with people. And sometimes they're going to be guests, sometimes high profile. Sometimes you might not have heard of them but they're going to be interesting. I've always been told that when I talk to people, I interview people. Okay. It's not even intentional, but it's maybe innate because of my reporter, quote unquote, journalist background. But I do feel like once we get to talking, I will get the best out of you. And hopefully that's what I'm able to provide here. Hopefully those are the stories. That's the information. And again, it's not always going to be about LA. It might be from LA, but listen, we all eat fast food. We all eat cheeseburgers. The cheeseburger comes from Los Angeles. Let's talk about that history. Let's talk about how the cheeseburger didn't exist until 1924, 1924. That is so recent until this dude named Lionel Sternberger at a place called the right spot in Pasadena had the foresight to put a slice of cheese on a hamburger and the cheeseburger was born. Guess what? The world around people eat cheeseburgers like LA has this outsized impact for such a new city and it's awesome and it's fun and I want to learn and I want to share that. And for me, whew, big component of what this is going to be, this is going to be therapy.
And I got one for you right now, in fact. Let me take a sip of this water. Might even have to have a sip of this tequila. Hold on. Hold on. Give me one sec. This is going to be therapy for me, and I'll tell you why. Stuff like this happens quite often, right? I'm out here trying to do my best, shine a positive light on people, on culture, on Los Angeles. And today, as I mentioned, I did a story on Fernando Valenzuela and the Dodgers retired his jersey. And it's a big deal because Fernando Valenzuela is an institution in Los Angeles. He came of age in 1980, early 1980s as a teenager from Mexico, tiny, tiny town in Mexico, the son of indigenous peoples down there. Such an unlikely story. And he dominated and Dodger Stadium became Fernando mania. And guess what happened? Mexican people and Latino people started coming to the stadium again. And why that was a big deal. And that, that doesn't even seem like anything that you'd bat an eyelash at now. In the 60s and 70s, um, the Mexican communities of Los Angeles were not too happy with the Dodgers because of what had happened previously. The O'Malley family, when they moved to Los Angeles, they, they raised all of the properties in Chavez Ravine. Chavez Ravine is where Dodger Stadium is. And now the government has something called eminent domain where they could take your property if they pay you fair market value. But 28 of those families did not want to move. And it was a tragedy what happened. Again, the homes were bulldozed. People were forcefully removed. There was an elementary school buried under what is now as third base at Dodger Stadium. And look, needless to say, people didn't take too kindly to that, especially the huge Latino, Hispanic communities in Los Angeles. So for 20 plus years, they just wouldn't go to games. They didn't support the team. And here comes Fernando. And now again, he doesn't heal all wounds, but you know how sports is this kind of societal equalizer. Like people don't have that much in common on a large scale to celebrate because most things are polarizing. But in cities, what sports does is unify and the Dodgers were winning. And it was because of this chubby little left-handed kid from Mexico, Fernando Valenzuela, and the stadium starts filling up. The Dodgers are drawing 3 million fans a year. And yes, a lot of them were Mexican, Latino, the whole heritage. And Fernando mania led to the culture of Dodger Stadium, where Dodger Stadium today looks more like Los Angeles. It, it is a perfect representation of Los Angeles. And I love that. And that's one of the main, as even as a, even not as a baseball fan, it's a great reason to go to Dodger Stadium because you're like, this is really Los Angeles, like all in one place. And so I do this post today. And it was a good post, man. It really was. I do research. I do a shitload of research, in fact. I spend six to eight hours on every episode. I use my journalistic background to make sure it's accurate, to get the research, to put things together in a good, quick-moving, informative, and accurate way. And I even address the tragedy that happened in Chavez Ravine. Now, unfortunately... People who may not have been that familiar with my work, not familiar with previous episodes where I discussed all this. They started calling me out on social media. And again, as I mentioned, I'm an only child, so I'm thin skinned, man. This is I don't read the comments. I read all of my DMs and I get back to my DMs and I'm diligent about that. I'm, I'm obsessive about that because if you reach out to me personally, I want to reach out back. I'm the same way when I reach out to somebody, I hope for a response or an acknowledgement. But comments are tough because people talk shit. In the past, they talk about my nose. I'm Jewish, all right? So I got this big crooked nose. They talk about my shirts. They Fine, I don't care. I shoot from this weird angle. You see my nostrils. I don't care about all that. But I do care when you criticize my work. And people said stuff like, you have no right to talk about our culture. You have no right to talk about my people like that. And I acknowledged it. And these are kind of the like ways that I need to get this stuff off my chest the therapy, the podcast is going to be the therapy about that stuff. It's going to be cathartic, like positive or negative. And it's important to me. I want to be brutally honest. I want to just share with everybody what I'm feeling, what I'm going through. And again, on these journeys where we're learning, there are speed bumps, there are roadblocks, but we got to get around them. And if not, I'm going to sit and share with you. I'm going to have another glass tequila 
maybe some Red Bull and we're going to talk about it. And I want people to reach out. I want people to hit me in the DM because that's the engagement. Eventually, I want to have episodes where we it's kind of almost like a talk show where you have people on to express their comments and their thoughts because that's what this is all about. Without you guys, I don't have this opportunity. Without people DMing, I, when people DM, I get ideas, I get thoughts, and I'm inspired. And I want to give everybody a platform because ultimately everybody deserves it. And that's what's really important. Um, but... You know what? This is the first episode. I'm just thankful to everybody who stayed, who even checked this out. One download. I thank you. Literal prayer hand emoji in the words of Mac Miller. Um, but any download, if you've listened this far, man, genuinely thank you. Because without you, I am not here. And without the people at Odyssey, without my intermittent team, this doesn't exist. By the way, I got to tell you about my studio, Heart of Los Angeles. I got a team. I don't know if they want to be mentioned by name because they're both a little, let's say, camera shy. But this studio is awesome. It came together fast. I hope it sounds good. I know we spent some money on some serious equipment. But at the end of the day, I'm thankful. And this is going to be a really, really fun podcast. Thank you so much for listening. We're going to learn. We're going to explore. We're going to have some awesome guests. We're going to talk about Los Angeles and we're going to talk about the world. But in short, you know what? We're going to spend time together and I appreciate everybody and we're going to learn. We're going to laugh. We're going to cry. Seriously, I'm a crier. I'm, I'm the kind of guy who cries at sensitive commercials, seriously. But either way, we're going to take a minute. And even though it's been a lot longer than a minute, one of my favorite things, one of my favorite aspects, people are like, yo, you're posted more than a minute. Guess what? When you tell somebody, yo, I'm going to be there in a minute, that might mean three minutes, might mean 10 minutes, might mean an hour. And that's the beauty of in a minute. And that's what in a minute is all about. So I thank you for spending a minute with me. I have a love it. Thank you for letting me talk. Thank you for giving me this forum. Thank you for Odyssey for providing me the distribution of the podcast. But thank you everybody for being here and I'm looking forward to it. All right. It's been a minute.